Okay, my name is Robin Snyder. Uh, I taught for years. I left teaching. I now do uh, consulting work for several companies. And I got into Lua about two years ago when I needed to switch editors. I'll talk about that tomorrow. And I was looking for something that would let me have full control in scripting. I found Lua. Since then, I've been using Lua for several programs that use Lua. And I found I could put it into my Delphi Pascal programs and add scripting to them. That's some of what I did here. And I use it for prototyping. I'm going to talk about incrementally developing and implementing Hirschberg's longest common subsequence algorithm using Lua. I wanted to implement this just to prototype so I could understand it and then use it in some regression testing. And after putting Lua into Delphi, I realized if I'm just doing regression testing for developing small languages with small regression tests, uh, I can pretty much just use Lua <laughs> to, do the, to do this part. Okay. Let's go uh, skip all the math definitions. Here are two example strings, nematode knowledge and empty bottle. Now, I took these examples from a some notes I found online, particularly the two text strings, and I'll credit David Epstein. I looked him up earlier today, so I just took his two examples, looked at his notes as a, in addition to a bunch of other notes. Does everyone see those are symbols, letters? And in those letters, we're going to look for the longest common subsequence, which would be any sequence of letters Let's just go left to right. You can go right to left, but we'll go left to right and pick out the letters that appear in both in the same order. <clears throat> For example, those are the strings, and the length of is them are 18 and 12. Now I'll mention I stopped using I I never use PowerPoint. Uh, almost never use PowerPoint, but I always use the HTML generated notes. Uh, instead of PowerPoint, I'll just mention that some of this is, some of these notes are developed in a text formatter where these are the Lua notes, and if you can see that, those are the strings, right, that I just displayed. But this, this kind of like Lua tech, these are actual Lua code within the formatter, and I just used a bracket with dots inside to represent Lua expressions. So that where it says A equals the value of variable A and the length of the string A is equal to M, when that shows up on the notes, it actually substitutes them in. So that's another example of Lua. Anyway, let's get back to the longest common subsequence. So you might look at this and say, oh, okay, E, e M, T, dash, O, L, E. And for this example, that's the longest common subsequence. And you'll notice here there's an E here and an E there. Which E do we pick? It depends on how you implement the algorithm. Let's point out, do you notice that these lines that connect them never cross? If those lines were to cross, these would be out of sequence. In general, because there's more than one, there uh, could be more than one. Now, these symbols can be anything that can be matched. I'm using letters just to make it easy. They could be letters of an alphabet. They could be lines of text or nucleotides in DNA. We're going to use letters, but it could be any of these. For example, in DNA, you have these sequences of letters that go out billions, right, for the whole genome. And... I'm not sure how they use them, but they will use these techniques and they look for very fast algorithms. I'm going to present just one that's reasonably good, space and time efficient, and works for small examples. If you want to scale it up, you have to make it a little more efficient. You may have seen this for file comparison. Has anyone used WinMerge or DiffMerge or some other merge compare utility to compare for regression testing to see the changes? Well, utilities like that will use, this is the core algorithm that's used to compare those. For example, here is 
I use win merge, some people use diff merge. Let me go to a If you can see this, we said our sequence was what? E M T I had an underscore here O L E. So does everyone see that the left one represents the bottom line? The right one represents the top line. The, one, the lines that are all white are the ones that are similar. The ones that are in uh, yellowish orange are the ones that are different. Now, you use this uh, a lot in regression testing where you have output and you want, or something's changed and you have the original and you want to compare the files and decide, well, what's changed in this? If someone put a patch in or something, you want to compare the two and just look at the changes. That's where this is used. Now, the longest common subsequence algorithm is called a dual algorithm of the uh, shortest edit distance sequence. Someone talked about a terminal, what terminal editor, where you, I guess, edit from a terminal. I'll mention that in a second. But the edit distance here would be if we insert the n over here and we insert this, or we uh, insert a p and an a here, and we move these over, each one of those is an edit operation, and the minimum edit distance is the minimum number of operations you need to move one into the other, to make them the same. Uh, my thesis advisor, or ch chair advisor way back, he did an algorithm and published some papers along this line, which I didn't realize what it was till a long time later, where he was doing the, the terminal editor where you wanted to update the screen and you wanted the minimum number of edits to minimize the communication cost in order to make what you're seeing what's there. And so this is that same algorithm. One is where you compare your changes and the other is you want to move one into the other, convert one to the other. And I always wondered how this worked and I finally decided I want to find out how this worked and I used Lua to prototype it. Uh, and it's also interesting if you're looking at algorithms because it uses a number of different techniques in order to do this where we'll use one and another and another and each one will lead to the other. And let's just move on with it. Okay. So the first is a top-down algorithm and this is easiest seen with a diagram. Here we have a two-dimensional grid where we have nematode knowledge on the top and we have empty bottle on the left. We would like to find the longest common subsequence. Now how are we going to do that? If you think, and some people figured it out a long time ago, uh, but this grid represents a lot of different possible strings. And let's see how that works. Now, each of those strings, if we take the E off the end, we're going to cut one column off of this grid. If we cut the E at the bottom, the empty bottle off, we're going to have one less row. And each cell in here represents a comparison of two different string lengths. And so we have a lot of them in there. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is that we have symmetries here. So we can flip the order of the strings, reverse them, either one. Uh, we can go forward or backward in our algorithm through the strings and, you know, reverse them, flip them. Uh, or we can flip the order, you know, transpose that matrix. So they're all going to yield the same one and we'll need part of that later. Now, uh, comments problem solving technique is to take a big problem and divide it into a smaller problem. It's what a divide and conquer approach. If you can take a bigger problem and make it into a smaller one, then you can eventually solve the problem by getting down to where you only have an instance of one. Now in the first, initially you try to get it reduced by a size of one. That'll give us like an n squared algorithm. 
And eventually we say, well, can we divide this in half each time? And that makes it a lot more efficient. Let's start from the end. And the, at the end, we have an E. The E matches the end of both strings. Does everyone see that? Yeah. Now, if the E is at the end or of what we're looking at, because this box will keep getting smaller, that means we can consider this to be part of the longest common substring. We can now make the problem one smaller. We'll reduce it by one column and one row. Now we've got to solve the smaller problem. Okay. So if they match, we've solved the smaller problem. Or we, we've solved this problem and converted it into a smaller problem. The only other thing that can happen is these two do not match. Well, let's go to the next smaller box. Uh, the G and the L do not match. So there are two possible, well, two things that can happen. Uh, they both cannot be part of the longest common substring. If they were, it would be different at this point. But it is possible that one or the other will be part of this longest common substring. So what we're going to do is suppose that the L is the one that's not part of the substring. That means it's possible that the G will be. The G up there. Here. In that case, we would solve the problem for this smaller instance all possible substrings of that length. Conversely, if the G were not part of it, we would eliminate the column. We have a smaller problem. And it's possible, then, that this L is part of the substring. Uh, that gives us our algorithm, the recursive algorithm. And here we're using strings, A and B. If the length of either is 0, then we'll return nothing. There is no match. Else, we're going to pick the ending part. If the two at the end are equal, then what? We're going to take that letter and append it to a recursive call to the least common substring of those two boxes, one from A uh, going to M minus 1 and the other going to N minus 1. So we're going to pass it A. Okay, and so we've reduced the problem there by the, the whole box or row and a column. Uh, in the other case, the, we said what happens? We're going to check out the two different boxes, and we're going to pass it to parameters recursively, and we're, we're going to return the maximum of those two, because that will be the longest one. So from the diagrams, which I like to work with diagrams rather than just the code initially, we then find the algorithm that works. Now, how well does this work? It works correctly, but it may not be very efficient. In fact, it is not very efficient. Okay. Partly, when you rewrite these strings, you pass lots of strings around. It's inefficient, and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of space. So we're going to improve the algorithm. And we do this by, we're now going to return just the length of that maximal subsequence. We're not going to care about what letters they are, just how long it is. And then later, uh, then we'll find a way to recover that. And to do that, in the, I'm going to start using a list, no, no, longer, no longer being going to use string symbols just a list of individual character strings, and we're going to pass the ending location.
So we're going to put everything in A, B, and go into C. So our original algorithm with this, we're just going to get the length now, is if we're at the beginning, going from 1 to 0, there's nothing left. It's 0. If the two characters match, then we're going to make it smaller. I and J are each one smaller, plus we've found one in the length. Otherwise, we're going to take those two different boxes, one from I to J minus 1, from one from I minus 1 to J. We're going to return the maximum of that. Okay, that's going to give us a... Yeah. That's going to give us the maximum length. The next step is to put all these into a table, a two-dimensional table. And we're going to initialize everything to minus 1, or you could set a default value for the table with the meta table method. I did it this way. It made it easier for what I was doing. And minus 1 means we haven't covered anything yet. We don't know the length of the least common subs least, uh, longest common subsequence. And we're going to modify the algorithm to look like this, which is the same thing except now we're going to have an L matrix, which is a two-dimensional matrix of the lengths. When we do this with the recursive algorithm, we're going to get this for the length of all the substrings. So if we, yeah. And now we need a way to backtrack through it. So the maximum length is seven using this algorithm. And we want to extract the maximal common subsequence from that. And it's easier to see geometrically here with the diagram. If a cell is uh, greater than the one on top and one to the left, that's part of the sequence, and we go diagonally. Otherwise, we follow the greatest value until we hit another place where it's greater than the two, one above and one to the left. And, we, and you, uh, the way this works, we can follow it in different ways. But we follow it up here, and each place where it's green is where we went diagonally, and that's where there's a letter in the greatest common subsequence. Okay, And when you look at the papers, uh, there's also a graph theoretic uh, approach to this. Uh, where you can make these nodes and edges, but I just wanted to understand it and have something that would work. Okay, and here's the, we would go to code and we would extract those paths, where if they're the same, we go back recursively to the one diagonally, I minus one, J minus one. Otherwise, we look for the one that's uh, uh, the greatest, and we follow that path till we get to a place where we can... Uh, extract something else, or go move to the next one. Okay, now the recursive solution is very inefficient, so you can use memoization, which means we'll just remember where we were, so if it was a minus one, if it's not less than zero, the value in that L matrix, we'll just uh, use the previously computed value. Now going back to that do you see some of these blank spots in there? Like here's one in the middle. Remember you go up and to the left, two different cases, which is inefficient. It could happen that when you go up and you go over and you go left and you go up, you get to the same cell or you skip a cell, but it means you're computing those things more than once. So in that case, you want to uh, skip those or use memoization to avoid that. Now, Hirschberg did a paper. In the notes, I put 74. That's when he submitted it and got the revision. It's actually 75. A little three-page paper that takes a while to sift through. It's very mathematical, but not too bad. And it explains this, uh, and that's where the source comes from. Because what he did is he made this efficient. This is very inefficient. You can't use it this way except for really small cases, and it takes a while. So the divide and conquer approach, we make everything, sm each, at each iteration or recursive call, we make things smaller, in this case by one. That's slow. 
If we can make it by a half or something like that, then we get a much faster algorithm, and that's the insight he had. Now, what he realized is taking this with the, what he did is the, you see this top left to the, he's going to divide this into a top and bottom part, divide it by half. Then for the top half, he's going to use that algorithm we just talked about, only he's going to do it in a bottom-up fashion using a dynamic programming. Because remember, each one, each value only did, Determined, depended on what? The one above it, the one to the left, and possibly the one diagonal. Which means instead of recursively coming from the lower right up to the upper left, you can do it bottom up from the upper left to the bottom right, do it very efficiently with just a loop that indexes and moves across. Then he realized, oh, if all I need is the distance, I only need, for that top part, I only need two rows. If I got 10,000 rows, I only need two rows because I just need the one before and the one I'm at, and I can move the whole way down or the whole way to the center. So what, I'm skipping that part but that, uh, for time, but so he has a, you have an algorithm that moves from the upper left to the lower right of the top half. It's going to come down to here. Then you reverse everything. In the paper, you have to realize he's moving strings back and forth. You don't want to move the array, so you just move the code, change the code to move from the lower right to the upper left. What that means when this blue horizontal line divides it is the upper part finds the least, the distance, least common, uh, or the greatest common subsequence, the length of that for empty underscore and nematode knowledge. And the bottom one finds the reverse greatest common distance for bottle and nematode knowledge. What he's going to end up with then is a row at the dash here going across, which keeps increasing or staying the same, and one going from right to left that increases. And then he realized that, oh, where these, where the, the numbers change, that's where that little path we did is going to cross. Then he does a little bit of mathematical proof to show if you take, add these two together, in this case here, the greatest sum is seven, then if you, you can divide either to the right of the leftmost one or to the, or to the left of the rightmost one. What that's going to do, that gives you this second blue line. So you know it crosses here. What does that let you do? That's going to let you divide the problem up into smaller. So now we're going to divide it up into this. We, we now have two smaller problems we can handle each separately. So instead of going through this whole thing, we've now cut it by half. And if you when you do regression checking on your files, you want to see what's changed. You might have 10,000 lines in each code, and you know people have changed lines here and there. You want to compare the two. Well, you need something efficient that's going to divide, you know, cut out 5,000 at a time or so. So now we're going to do the same thing for each of these. We'll do a blue line in the middle, cut it in half. We'll re rerun the bottom up one left to right to get the top. Lengths. Then we're going to do the one in the bottom, you know, from the right to the left, uh, bottom to uh, from there to get the two. And we're going to put these together. We got two, three. So those three right there is going to divide up, and that will allow us to divide this once again. And we keep doing that. At some point, one of the row, a row will only have one. We can't divide a row, horizontal row, in half. At that point, we go through and find the one that matches. Now, notice I said it could be this E or that E. Well, it depends. You know, you've got it down to here. Do you want this E or that E? And if you do the code one way, it 
you get the greatest one, otherwise you get the other one, or you come up with another way to pick which one you want. Some of these aren't smaller to do that yet, so you do the algorithm again. Yeah. Now, some of them you have from before. Some, some don't have anything in. You've divided it down and there's nothing left. And some have, in this case, two, and you pick the first one of them that matches. And we end up with EMT-OLE. And that gives us our longest common subsequence. <clears throat> and so I put a little animation from the different images. You can see how it's dividing each one up from the big problem. Now, to make the images, I do a lot of uh, PostScript programming, and I've been doing that a long time. So what I ended up doing is modifying uh, dynamically some of the, uh, the Lua code. So the Lua code would actually output the PostScript that I need in order to generate the images. So I don't, you know, I'm not going to sit there and do those images by hand, so I needed to be able to put those in. And something I'll talk about tomorrow. In some of that code, I'll use a text formatting approach where if it's the debug mode, I'm going to output uh, display information. That display information will get output to a PostScript file, and then the PostScript file will include that in to get those images. Then I can turn the debug mode off and get the nice code that I can just put the plain code into automatically because there's some macros up here which will output that to a file which will get included into the uh, notes file so that I can, include, I can include the actual code I'm using at different places but not have to handle any of that manually. Okay, uh, here are some of the functions. Let me make that a little smaller. Oops. Where there's a traverse. Remember I said we're going to go from the upper left to lower right? And in the bottom part we're going to go from the lower right to the lower left. Well, that's the traverse. We're going to traverse. In this case we're using the full L matrix instead of just the two rows. I use the full L matrix because it makes it it's a lot easier to get the graphics output to put everything in place and output it then to show the graphics. Uh, so in this case, it's just going from one index to another, and it has the dx value, which could be we're going plus one or minus one. So we can use the same code for each of that. And then there's the actual Hirschberg algorithm, where it's going to take an L matrix, an A and a B, we're going to go from I1 to I3, J1 to J3. Initially, we're going to start A and B, the whole thing. Okay. Now, remember in that uh, ending diagram, if the, if the J1 greater than J3, that is, if, if, there's all, if there's no row left, that means there's nothing there. So that means, in this case, A doesn't have a corresponding element in the sequence. If there's, oh, okay, that was, that was the column. If there's only one row, remember you go through and you pick one of them. So you go through and you pick one of them. And then if none of them were picked, it means that there's no sequence in there. And the last part is where you divide up the problem. So if we're not at the end, if there's nothing, if there's nothing there, we're done. If there's only one row, we find the one we want. Otherwise, we're now going to break the problem into two parts, divided in half. We're going to traverse the L matrix from the upper left, which is I1, I2, to the lower right, in going positive. The other case, we're going to go from the end to the beginning, from bottom to top to that middle point at minus one. Once we get those two values, we then have to go through and sum up 
the different elements and find the one that's on the left and that's where we can divide and put the vertical line and then we can call Hirschberg recursively on uh, those two smaller uh, rectangles. Okay. Now, I was interested in this algorithm. I wanted to use Lua to prototype it. And I spent a lot of time looking at the article and figuring out, well, what are they actually doing here? And some of the articles on the internet, some had little problems here and some weren't quite right there, but I eventually pieced everything together. Uh, Hirschberg had a good paper, but he used math notation, so he was flipping and reversing stuff, which you couldn't do as well with the computer. So hopefully I gave you a flavor for how that works. Uh, it's really hard to get an understanding just looking at it real quick, but the diagrams helped me. And now I understand it better, and I want to be able to use this when I'm comparing files or, you, or uh, using this particular uh, methodology. Okay, uh, that's what I have for today. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Uh, there's no license on it. Uh, I, I can send it to you. <laughs> I can put it on my page, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, once you get it done, that gives you the, you know, the longest common substring. You have the correspondence between the two. And now, if you're going to do it like, uh, if you're going to display it, where's that at, win merge? If you're going to display it, like win merge and diff merge give the same same answer for the same input, uh, you have to figure out then, okay, which one's different and how am I going to display that and what am I going to do with it? But yeah, but uh, that's what I wanted to do with it. Other questions? Uh, you have to see me and remind me. I can post it on my internet page, but not right now. Yeah, uh, just a question related to the, um, you mentioned earlier, the, the terminal update problem where you've yes. got a screen here and um, uh, and I remember seeing some um, algorithms and, and code that actually did this, and some of them actually went as far as when when considering the other changes to be made, um, the cost of making one change may not be constant, right? Because yeah, you might they'll, be able to they'll I, re I remember looking at that. They'll decide what's the cost of an insert, what's the cost of a delete, and how does that vary if the lines are bigger and the size mm -hmm. of them? But see, your, uh, the whole assumption is your communication line has a cost to it, but your cost at either end is not significant. You've got lots of processing right. power, so you want to be able to figure that out. Yeah, and they put a cost to it, and then you, your goal is to minimize that cost. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the algorithm you described helps identify the changes, the potential changes, but a separate operation is is computing the cost of the different alternatives? Uh, I'm not doing anything with the cost. Yeah, okay. Because if you're doing a compare of two files, there's no communication transfer, so there's no real cost. But they're called dual problems because that same problem, you can look at that in two ways. Mm -hmm. You can say, what are the differences? You know, what are the similarities? How do I edit this thing one into the other? So that's same algorithm, but two, two uses. Yes. Was there a way specifically that Lua helped with this developing this algorithm or implementing this algorithm? Well, uh, I've started prototyping in Lua because it's nice, it's easy to use, it's quick, responsive, uh, and that's pretty much why I'd use it. Uh, I did put this into the Delphi Pascal, but whenever you move to a compiled language like you know C plus plus C sharp, there's a more overhead to it. So there's a whole lot of flexibility here in using Lua. And I think some of that comes, if you've ever worked with Lisp or Prolog without backtracking, but just the lists in it, uh, it gives you a very flexible way with the associative tables to handle that uh, moving things back and forth. And so that's, that's what I like about it, is I can represent problems very quickly. I used to do that in Prolog, or you could do it in Lisp, well, this is a lot sim more similar to languages 
other languages being used, so you can do a lot of the same things as the closures and the, I had a functional programming background. Okay, so I can use things like that. It just makes it nice to do. And I can now put it into my Delphi applications because I can hook in Lua scripting with it. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you.